Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 9 Powder and Arms. The Hispaniola lay some way out, and we went under the figureheads and around the sterns of many other ships, and their cables sometimes grated beneath our keel, and sometimes swung above us. At last, however, we swung alongside, and were met and saluted as we stepped aboard by the mate, Mr. Arrow, a brown old sailor, with earrings in his ears, and a squint. He and the squire were very thick and friendly but I soon observed that things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. This last was a sharp-looking man, who seemed angry with everything on board, and was soon to tell us why, for we had hardly got down into the cabin when a sailor followed us. "'Captain Smollett, sir, axing to speak with you,' said he. "'I am always at the captain's orders. Show him in,' said the squire. The captain, who was close behind his messenger, entered at once and shut the door behind him. "'Well, Captain Smollett, what have you to say? All well, I hope, all shipshape and seaworthy.' "'Well, sir,' said the captain, "'better speak plain, I believe, at the risk of offence. I don't like this cruise. I don't like the men, and I don't like my officer. That's short and sweet.' "'Perhaps, sir, you don't like the ship?' inquired the squire, very angry, as I could see. "'I can't speak to that, sir, not having seen her tried,' said the captain. "'She seems a clever craft. More I can't say.' "'Possibly, sir, you may not like your employer either,' said the squire. But here Dr. Livesey cut in. "'Stay a bit,' said he. "'Stay a bit.' No use of such questions as that, but to produce ill-feeling. The captain has said too much, or he has said too little, and I am bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. You don't, you say, like this cruise. Now why? I was engaged, sir, on what we call sealed orders, to sail this ship for that gentleman where he should bid me said the captain. So far, so good. But now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair. Now, do you? No, said Dr. Livesey. I don't. Next, said the captain, I learn that we are going after treasure. Hear it from my own hands, mind you. Now, treasure is ticklish work. I don't like treasure voyages on any account, and I don't like them above all when they are secret and when, begging your pardon, Mr. Trelawney, the secret has been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot? asked the squire. It's a way of speaking, said the captain. Blabbed, I mean. It's my belief neither of you gentlemen know what you are about, but I'll tell you my way of it, life or death, and a close run. That is all clear, and I dare say true enough, replied Dr. Livesey. We take the risk, but we are not so ignorant as you believe us. Next you say you don't like the crew. Are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir returned Captain Smollett, and I think I should have had the choosing of my own hands. If you go to that, perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should, perhaps, have taken you along with him, but the slight, if there be one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow? I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman, but he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep himself to himself, shouldn't drink with the men before the mast. "'Do you mean he drinks?' cried the squire. "'No, sir,' replied the captain. "'Only that he's too familiar. "'Well, now, and the short and the long of it, captain?' asked the doctor. "'Tell us what you want.' "'Well, gentlemen, 
Are you determined to go on this cruise? Like iron, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. Then, as you've heard me very patiently, saying things that I could not prove, hear me a few words more. They are putting the powder and arms in the forehold. Now you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there? First point. Then you are bringing four of your own people with you, and they tell me some of them are to be berthed forward. Why not give them the berths here, besides the cabin? Second point. Any more? asked Mr. Trelawney. One more, said the captain. There's been too much a blabbing already. Far too much, agreed the doctor. I'll tell you what I have heard myself, continued Captain Smollett, that you have a map of an island, that there's crosses on the map to show where treasure is, and that the island lies, and then he named the latitude and longitude exactly. I never told that, cried the squire, to a soul. The hands know it, sir, returned the captain. Livesey! That must have been your Hawkins!' cried the squire. "'It doesn't much matter who it was,' replied the doctor, and I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr. Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure. He was so loose a talker. Yet in this case I believe he was really right, and that nobody had told the situation of the island. "'Well, gentlemen,' continued the captain, I don't know who has this map, but I make it a point it shall be kept secret even from me and Mr. Arrow. Otherwise, I would ask you to let me resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep this matter dark, and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship, manned with my friend's own people, and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words— you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett, with no intention to take offence, I deny your right to put words into my mouth. No captain, sir, would be justified in going to sea at all if he had ground enough to say that. As for Mr. Arrow, I believe him thoroughly honest. Some of the men are the same, all may be, for what I know. But I am responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man jack aboard of her. I see things going as I think not quite right, and I ask you to take certain precautions, or let me resign my berth, and that's all. Captain Smollett began the doctor with a smile. Did you ever hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, I dare say, but you remind me of that fable. When you came in here, I'll stake my wig you meant more than this. Doctor, said the captain, you are smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more I would! cried the squire. Had Livesey not been here, I should have seen you to the deuce. As it is, I have heard you. I will do as you desire, but I think the worst of you. That's as you please, sir, said the captain. You'll find I do my duty. And with that he took his leave. Trelawney, said the doctor, contrary to all my notions, I believe you have managed to get two honest men on board with you, that man and John Silver. "'Silver, if you like,' cried the squire, "'but as for that intolerable humbug, I declare I think his conduct unmanly, unsailorly, and downright un-English.' "'Well,' said the doctor, "'we shall see.' When we came on deck, the men had begun already to take out the arms and powder, yo-hoing at their work, while the captain and Mr. Arrow stood by superintending. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled. 
six berths had been made astern out of what had been the after part of the main hold, and this set of cabins was only joined to the galley and forecastle by a sparred passage on the port side. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mr. Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, the doctor, and the squire were to occupy these six berths. Now Red Ruth and I were to get two of them, and Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion, which had been enlarged on either side till you might almost have called it a roundhouse. Very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks, and even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew, but that is only guess, for, as you shall hear, we had not long the benefit of his opinion. We were all hard at work changing the powder and the berths, when the last man or two, and Long John along with them, came off in a shore-boat. The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness, and as soon as he saw what was doing, "'So ho, mates,' said he, "'what's this?' "'We're a-changing the powder, Jack,' answers one. "'Why, by the powers!' cried Long John. "'If we do, we'll miss the morning tide.' "'My orders,' said the captain shortly. "'You may go below, my man. Hands will want supper.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' answered the cook, and, touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction of his galley. "'That's a good man, captain,' said the doctor. "'Very likely, sir,' replied Captain Smollett. "'Easy with that man, easy!' He ran on to the fellows who were shifting the powder, and then, suddenly observing me examining the swivel we carried amidships, a long brass nine, "'Here you, ship's boy!' he cried. "'Out of that! Off with you to the cook, and get some work!' And then, as I was hurrying off, I heard him say quite loudly to the doctor, I'll have no favourites on my ship." I assure you I was quite of the squire's way of thinking, and hated the captain deeply. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Voyage All that night we were in a great bustle getting things stowed in their place, and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like, coming off to wish him a good voyage and a safe return. We never had a night at the Admiral Bembo when I had half the work, and I was dog-tired when, a little before dawn, the boatswain sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck, or was so new and interesting to me, the brief commands, the shrill notes of the whistle, the men bustling to their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. "'Now, Barbecue, tip us a stave!' cried one voice. "'The old one!' cried another. "'Oi, oi, mates!' said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest!' And then the whole crew bore chorus. "'Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum!' and at the third ho drove the bars before them with a will. Even at that exciting moment it carried me back to the old Admiral Bembo in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in the chorus. But soon the anchor was short up, soon it was hanging dripping at the bows, soon the sails began to draw, and the land and shipping to flit by on either side, and before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola began her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. I am not going to relate the voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship, and the crew were capable seamen, and the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which require to be known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, and people did what they pleased with him. But that was by no means the worst of it, for after a day or two at sea he began to appear on deck with hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself, sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. 
Sometimes for a day or two he would be almost sober, and attend to his work at least passably. In the meantime we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we pleased, we could do nothing to solve it, and when we asked him to his face he would only laugh, if he were drunk, and if he were sober deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. He was not only useless as an officer and a bad influence among the men, but it was plain that at this rate he must soon kill himself outright, so nobody was much surprised nor very sorry when, one dark night, with a head sea, he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. "'Overboard,' said the captain. "'Well, gentlemen, that saves the trouble of putting him in irons.' And there we were without a mate, and it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The boatswain, Job Anderson, was the likeliest man aboard, and though he kept his old title, he served in a way as mate. Mr. Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful, for often he took a watch himself in easy weather. And the coxswain, Israel Hands, was a careful, wily, old, experienced seaman, who could be trusted at a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me on to speak of our ship's cook, Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard ship he carried his crutch by a lanyard around his neck, to have both hands as free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against the bulkhead, and, propped against it, yielding to every movement of the ship, get on with his cooking like someone safe ashore. Still more strange was it to see him in the heaviest of weather cross the deck. He had a line or two rigged up to help him across the widest spaces. Long John's earrings, they were called, and he would hand himself from one place to another, now using the crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard, as quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who had sailed with him before expressed their pity to see him so reduced. "'He's no common man, Barbecue,' said the coxswain to me. He had a good schooling in his young days, and can speak like a book when he's so minded, and brave a lion's nothing alongside of Long John. I've seen him grapple four and knock their heads together, him unarmed." All the crew respected and even obeyed him. He had a way of talking to each and doing everybody some particular service. To me he was unweariedly kind, and always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin, the dishes hanging up burnished, and his parrot in a cage in the corner. "'Come away, young Hawkins,' he would say. "'Come and have a yarn with John. Nobody more welcome than yourself, my son. Sit you down and hear the news. Here's Cap'n Flint. I calls my parrot Cap'n Flint, after the famous buccaneer. Here's Cap'n Flint, predicting success to our voyage. Wasn't you, Cap'n?" And the parrot would say, with great rapidity, "'Pieces of eight, pieces of eight, pieces of eight, till you wondered that it was not out of breath, or till John threw his handkerchief over the cage. "'Now that bird,' he would say, "'is maybe two hundred years old, Hawkins. They live forever, mostly, and if anybody see more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate. She's been at Madagascar, and at Malabar, and Suriname, and Providence, and Portobello. She was at the fishing up of the wrecked plate ships. It's there she learned pieces of eight, and little wonder, three hundred and fifty thousand of Americans. She was at the boarding of the Viceroy of the Indies, out of Goa she was. And to look at her, you would think she was a babby. But you smelt powder, didn't you, Cap'n? Stand by to go about, the parrot would scream. Ah, she's handsome craft, she is, the cook would say, and give her sugar from his pocket. And then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on, passing belief for wickedness. There, John would add, you can't pitch and not be mucked, lad. Here's the poor old innocent bird of mine, swearing blue fire and none the wiser you may later that. 
She would swear the same, in a manner of speaking, before the chaplain. And John would touch his forelock with a solemn way he had that made me think he was the best of men. In the meantime the squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty distant terms with one another. The squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the captain. The captain, on his part, never spoke but when he was spoken to, and then sharp and short and dry, and not a word wasted. He owned, when driven into a corner, that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, that some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see, and all had behaved fairly well. As for the ship, he had taken a downright fancy to her. "'She'll lie a point nearer the wind than a man has the right to expect of his own married wife, sir. But—' he would add, "'All I say is, we're not home again, and I don't like the cruise.' The squire, at this, would turn away and march up and down the deck, chin in air. "'A trifle more of that man,' he would say, "'and I should explode.' We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and he must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise, for it is my belief that there was never a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going at the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, as, for instance, if the squire heard it was any man's birthday, and all was a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for any one to help himself that had a fancy. "'Never knew good to come of it yet,' the captain said to Dr. Livesey. "'Spoil forecastle hands, make devils. That's my belief.' But good did come of the apple-barrel, as you shall hear, for if it had not been for that we should have had no note of warning, and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This is how it came about. We had run up the trades to get wind of the island we were after. I am not allowed to be more plain, and now we were running down for it with a bright lookout day and night. It was about the last day of our outward voyage, by the last computation. Some time that night, or latest before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. We were heading southwest and had a steady breeze abeam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipping her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing alow and aloft. Every one was in the bravest spirits, because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over, and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all forward, looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail, and whistling away gently to himself, and that was the only sound, excepting the swish of the sea against the bows, and around the sides of the ship. In I got bodily into the apple-barrel, and found there was scarce an apple left, but sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I had either fallen asleep or was on the point of doing so, when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I had heard a dozen words I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there trembling and listening, in the extreme of fear and curiosity, for from these dozen words I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended upon me alone. End of chapter 10 Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Adrian Pretzelis Chapter 11 What I Heard in the Apple Barrel No, not I, said Silver. Flint was cutting. I was quite a master along of my timber leg. The same side I lost my leg, old Pew lost his daylights. It was a master surgeon, him that amputated me, out of college and all, 
Latin by the bucket, and what not. But he was hanged like a dog, and sun-droid like the rest, at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men, that was, and comed of changing names to their ships. Royal Fortune, and so on. Now, what a ship was christened, so let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old Walrus, Flint's old ship, as I've seen her muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah! cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man, too, by all accounts, said Silver. I never sailed along a him. First with England, then with Flint, that's my story. And now here on my own account, in a manner of speaking. I laid by nine hundred safe from England, and two thousand after Flint. They ain't bad for a man before the mast. All safe in bank. Tain't earning now. It's saving, does it? You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I don't know. Where's Flint's? Why, most of em are bored here and glad to get the duff. Been begging before that, some of em. Old Pew is as lost his sight and might have thought shame spends twelve hundred pounds in a year like a lord in parliament where is he now well he's dead now and under hatches but for two years before that shiver my timbers the man was starving he begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that by the powers well it ain't much use after all said the young seaman Tain't much use for fools you may lay to it, that nor nothing, cried Silver. But now you look here. You're young, you are, but you're smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You can imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery he had used to myself. I think, if I had been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. "'Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough, and they risk swinging. But they eat and drink like fightin' cocks, and when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets.' Now the most goes for rum and a good fling, and to see again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywhere is by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark you. Once back from this cruise I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough, too, says you. Ah, but I've lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself a nothing a heart desires, and slept soft and ate dainty all my days but when at sea. And how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well, said the other, but all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You daren't show face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was? asked Silver derisively. At Bristol in banks and places answered his companion. "'It were,' said the cook, "'it were when we weighed anchor, but my old missus has it all by now, and the spy-glasses sold, leasts and goodwill and rigging, and the old girl's off to meet me. I will tell you where, mate, for I trust you. But it'd make jealousy mong the mates.' "'And you can trust your missus?' asked the other. "'Gentlemen of fortune,' returned the cook, "'usually trust little among themselves, and right they are, you may lay to it. But I have a way with me, I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean, it won't be in the same world with old John.' 
there were some that was feared of pew, and some that was feared of flint. But flint his own self was feared of me, feared he was, and proud. They was the roughest crew afloat was flint's. The devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with them. Well, now I tell you I'm not a boasting man, and you've seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quite a master, lambs wasn't the word for flint's old buccaneers. Ah, you may be sure of yourself in old John's ship. Well, I, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't half a quarter like a job till I had this talk with you, John. But there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart too, answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrels shook. And a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clap my eyes on. By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate, and the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point I was soon to be relieved, for Silver, giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. "'Dick Square,' said Silver. "'Oh, I know Dick was square.' returned the voice of the coxswain, Israel Hands. "'He's no fool, is Dick.' He turned his quid and spat. "'But look here,' he went on. "'Here's what I want to know, Barbecue. How long are we a going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? I've had almost enough of Captain Smollett. He's hazed me long enough, by thunder!' I want to go into that cabin, I do. I want their pickles and wines and that. Israel, said Silver, your head ain't much account, nor never was. But you're able to hear, I reckon. Last ways your ears is big enough. Now here's what I say. You'll berth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word. "'And you may lay to that, my son.' "'Well, I don't say no, do I?' growled the coxswain. "'What I said is, when, that's what I say.' "'When, by the powers!' cried Silver. "'Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. "'The last moment I can manage, and that's when. "'Here is a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship for us. "'Here is this squire and doctor we a map and such. "'I don't know where it is, do I? "'No more do you,' says you. "'Well, then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff "'and help us to get it aboard by the powers. "'Then we'll see.' "'If I was sure of you all, sons a double Dutchman, "'I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us half-way back again before I struck.' "'Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think,' said the lad Dick. "'We're all forecastle hands, you mean,' snapped Silver. "'We can steer a course, but who's to set one? "'That's what all you gentlemen spit on first and last.' If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island, as soon as the blunt's on board, and a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides. I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. "'Easy all, old John,' cried Israel. "'Who's a-crossing of ye? "'Why, how many tall ships think ye now have I seen laid aboard, "'and how many brisk lads draw in the sun execution dock?' cried Silver. "'And all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry. "'You hear me? "'I've seen a thing or two at sea, I have. 
"'If you would only lay your course and appoint a windward, you would ride in carriages, you would, but not you. I know you. You'll have your milk for the rum to-morrow and go hang. Everybody knowed how you was a kind of a chaplain, John, but there's others who could hand and steer as well as you,' said Israel. "'They liked a bit of fun, they did.' They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling like jolly companions, every one. So, said Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Ah, they was a sweet crew, they was, only where are they? But, asked Dick, when we do lay them athwart, what are we going to do with them, anyhow? There is the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what would you think? Put em ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut em down like that much pork? That would have been flints or Billy Bones. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now hisself. He knows the long and short on it now, and if ever a rough hand come to port it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver, rough and ready. But mark you here, I'm a easy man. I'm quite the gentleman, says you, but this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote. Death. When I'm in Parliament, and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin a-coming home unlooked for like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, and when the time comes, why, let her rip. John, cried the coxswain, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see, said Silver. Only one thing I claim. I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands. Dick, he added, breaking off, you must jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leapt out and run for it if I had found the strength, but my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then some one seemingly stopped him, and the voice of Hans exclaimed, "'Oh, stow that! Don't you get suckin' of that bilge, John! Let's have a go of the rum!' "'Dick,' said Silver, "'I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news, for besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of em will jine. Hence there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one or another of the trio took the pannikin and drank, one, to luck, another, with a, ears to old flint. And Silver himself sang in a kind of song, ears to herself and old your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up I found the moon had risen and was slivering the mizzen-top, and shining white on the laugh of the foresail, and almost at the same time the voice on the lookout shouted, "'And ho!' End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Council of War There was a great rush of feet across the deck. I could hear people tumbling up from the cabin and the forecastle and slipping in an instant outside my barrel. I dived behind the foresail, and made a double toward the stern, and came out upon the open deck in time to join Hunter and Dr. Livesey in the rush for the weather-bow. 
There all hands were already congregated. A belt of fog had lifted almost simultaneously with the appearance of the moon. Away to the southwest of us we saw two low hills, about a couple of miles apart, and rising behind one of them a third and higher hill, whose peak was still buried in the fog. All three seemed sharp and conical in figure. So much I saw almost in a dream, for I had not yet recovered from my horrid fear of a minute or two before, and then I heard the voice of Captain Smollett issuing orders. The Hispaniola was laid a couple of points nearer the wind, and now sailed a course that would just clear the island to the east. "'And now, men,' said the captain, when all was sheeted home, "'has any one of you ever seen that land ahead?' "'I have, sir,' said Silver. "'I've watered there with a trader I was cooking.' "'The anchorage is on the south behind an islet, I fancy?' asked the captain. "'Yes, sir. Skeleton Island, they calls it. It were a main place for pirates once, and a hand we had on board knowed all their names for it. The hill to the nord they calls Foremast Hill. There are three hills in a row running southerd, four main and mizzen, sir. But the main, that's the big un with the cloud on it, they usually calls the spy glass, by reason of a lookout they kept when they was in the anchorage cleanin'. For it's there they clean their ships, sir, asking your pardon. I have a chart here, said Captain Smollett. See if that's the place. Long John's eyes burned in his head as he took the chart, but by the fresh look of the paper I knew he was doomed to disappointment. This was not the map we found in Billy Bone's chest, but an accurate copy complete in all things, names and heights and soundings, with the single exception of the red crosses and the written notes. Sharp as must have been his annoyance, Silver had the strength of mind to hide it. "'Yes, sir,' said he, "'this is the spot to be sure, and very prettily drawed out. Who might a done that, I wonder? The pirates were too ignorant, I reckon. Ah, here it is, Cap'n Kidd's Anchorage, just the name my shipmate called it. There is a strong current rounds along the south, and then away up nord up the west coast.' "'Right you was, sir,' said he, "'to haul your wind and keep the weather of the island. Leastways, if such was your intention as to enter and careen, there ain't no better place for that in these waters.' "'Thank you, my man,' said Captain Smollett. "'I'll ask you later on to give us a help. You may go.' I was surprised at the coolness with which John avowed his knowledge of the island, and I own I was half frightened when I saw him drawing nearer to myself. He did not know, to be sure, that I had overheard his counsel from the apple-barrel, and yet I had, by this time, taken such a horror of his cruelty, duplicity, and power, that I could scarce conceal a shudder when he laid his hand upon my arm. Ah! said he. This here is a sweet spot, this island. A sweet spot for a lad to get ashore on. You'll bathe and you'll climb trees, and you'll hunt goats, you will, and you'll get aloft on them hills like a goat yourself. Why, it makes me young again. I was going to forget my timber leg, I was. It's a pleasant thing to be young, and have ten toes you may lay to that. When you want to go a bit of exploring, you ask old John, and he'll put up a snack for you to take along. And clapping me in the friendliest way upon the shoulder, he hobbled off forward and went below. Captain Smollett, the squire, and Dr. Livesey were talking together on the quarter-deck, and, anxious as I was to tell them my story, I durst not interrupt them openly. While I was still casting about in my thoughts to find some probable excuse, Dr. Livesey called me to his side. 
he had left his pipe below, and, being a slave to tobacco, had meant that I should fetch it. But as soon as I was near enough to speak and not be overheard, I broke out immediately. "'Doctor, let me speak. Get the captain and squire down to the cabin, and then make some pretense to send for me. I have terrible news.' The doctor changed countenance a little, but next moment he was master of himself. "'Thank you, Jim,' said he quite loudly. "'That was all I wanted to know,' as if he had asked me a question. And with that he turned on his heel and rejoined the other two. They spoke together for a little, and though none of them started or raised his voice, or so much as whistled, it was plain enough that Dr. Livesey had communicated my request, for the next thing that I heard was the captain giving an order to Job Anderson, and all hands were piped on deck. "'My lads,' said Captain Smollett, "'I've a word to say to you. This land that we have sighted is the place we have been sailing to. Mr. Trelawney, being a very open-handed gentleman, as we all know, has just asked me a word or two and as I was able to tell him that every man on board had done his duty, a low and a loft, as I never asked to see it done better, why, he and I and the doctor are going below to the cabin to drink your health and luck, and you'll have grog served out to you to drink our health and luck. I'll tell you what I think of this. I think it handsome. And if you think as I do, You'll give a good sea cheer for the gentleman that does it. The cheer followed. That was a matter of course, but it rang out so full and hearty that I confess I could hardly believe these same men were plotting for our blood. One more cheer for Cap'n Smollett, cried Long John, when the first had subsided, and this was given with a will. On the top of that the three gentlemen went below and not long after word was sent forward that jim hawkins was wanted in the cabin i found them all three seated around the table a bottle of spanish wine and some raisins before them and the doctor smoking away with his wig on his lap and that i knew was a sign that he was agitated the stern window was open for it was a warm night and you could see the moon shining behind on the ship's wake now hawkins said the squire. You have something to say. Speak up. I did as I was bid, and, short as I could make it, told the whole details of Silver's conversation. Nobody interrupted me till I was done, nor did any one of the three of them make so much as a movement, but they kept their eyes upon my face from first to last. Jim, said Dr. Livesey, take a seat and they made me sit down at a table beside them, poured me out a glass of wine, filled my hands with raisins, and all three, one after the other, and each with a bow, drank my good health and their service to me for my luck and courage. "'Now, Captain,' said the squire, "'you were right, and I was wrong. I own myself an ass, and I await your orders.' "'No more an ass than I, sir,' returned the captain. "'I never heard of a crew that meant to mutiny, but that what signs before, for any man that had an eye in his head to see the mischief, and take steps accordingly. But this crew,' he added, "'beats me.' "'Captain,' said the doctor, "'with your permission, that's Silver, a very remarkable man.' "'He'd look remarkably well from a yard-arm, sir,' returned the captain. "'But this is talk. This don't lead to anything. "'I see three or four points, and with Mr. Trelawney's permission, I'll name em. "'You, sir, are the captain. It is for you to speak,' said Mr. Trelawney, grandly. First point,' began Mr. Smollett, "'we must go on because we can't turn back.' If I gave the word to turn about, they would rise at once. Second point, we have time before us, at least until this treasure's found. Third point, there are faithful hands. Now, sir, it's got to come to blows sooner or later, 
and what I propose is to take time by the forelock, as the saying is, and to come to blows some fine day when they least expect it. We can count, I take it, on your own home servants, Mr. Trelawney. As upon myself, declared the squire. Three, reckoned the captain. Ourselves make seven, counting Hawkins there. Now, about the honest hands? Most likely are Trelawney's own men, said the doctor. Those he picked up for himself before he lit on silver. Nay, replied the squire. Hands was one of mine. I did think I could have trusted hands, added the captain. And to think that they're all Englishmen, broke out the squire. Sir, I could find it in my heart to blow the ship up. Well, gentlemen, said the captain, the best that I can say is not much. We must lay to, if you please, and keep a bright lookout. It's trying on a man, I know. It would be pleasanter to come to blows. But there's no help for it till we know our men. Lay to and whistle for a wind. That's my view. Jim here, said the doctor, can help us more than any one. The men are not shy with him, and Jim is a noticing lad. Hawkins, I put prodigious faith in you, added the squire. I began to feel pretty desperate at this, for I felt altogether helpless. And yet, by an odd train of circumstances, it was indeed through me that safety came. In the meantime, talk as we pleased, there were only seven out of the twenty-six on whom we knew we could rely. And out of these seven, one was a boy, so that the grown men on our side were six to their nineteen. End of chapter 12 Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Adrian Pretzelis Chapter 13 How My Shore Adventure Began The appearance of the island when I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased, we had made a great deal of way during the night, and were now lying becalmed about half a mile to the southeast of the low eastern coast. Grey-coloured woods covered a large part of the surface. This even tint was indeed broken up by streaks of yellow sand-break in the lower lands, and by many tall trees of the pine family out-topping the others, some singly, some in clumps. But the general colouring was uniform and sad. The hills ran up clear above the vegetation in spires of naked rock. All was strangely shaped, and the spy-glass, which was by three or four hundred feet the tallest on the island, was likewise the strangest in configuration, running up sheer from almost every side, and then suddenly cut off at the top, like a pedestal to put a statue on. The Hispaniola was rolling scuppers under in the ocean swell. The booms were tearing at the blocks, the rudder was banging to and fro, and the whole ship creaking, groaning, and jumping like a manufactory. I had to cling tight to the backstay, and the world turned giddily before my eyes, for though I was a good enough sailor when there was way on, this standing still and being rolled about like a bottle was a thing I never learned to stand without a qualm or two, above all in the morning, on an empty stomach. Perhaps it was this, perhaps it was the look of the island, with its grey melancholy woods, and wild stone spires, and the surf that we could both see and hear, foaming and thundering on the steep beach. At least, although the sun shone bright and hot, and the shore-birds were fishing and crying all around us, and you would have thought any one would have been glad to get to land, after being so long at sea, my heart sank as the saying is, into my boots, and from that first look onward I hated the very thought of Treasure Island. We had a dreary morning's work before us, 
and there was no sign of any wind, and the boats had to be got out and manned, and the ship warped three or four miles round the corner of the island and up the narrow passage to the haven behind Skeleton Island. I volunteered for one of the boats, where I had, of course, no business. The heat was sweltering, and the men grumbled fiercely over their work. Anderson was in command of my boat, and instead of keeping the crew in order, he grumbled as loud as the worst. "'Well,' he said, with an oath, "'it's not forever.' I thought this was a very bad sign, for up to that day the men had gone briskly and willingly about their business, but the very sight of the island had relaxed the cords of discipline. All the way in Long John stood by the steersman and conned the ship. He knew the passage like the palm of his hand, and though the man in the chains got everywhere more water than was down on the chart, John never hesitated once. "'There's a strong scour with the ebb,' he said. "'And this here passage has been dug out, in a manner of speaking, with a spade.' We brought up just where the anchor was on the chart, about a third of a mile from each shore, the mainland on one side and Skeleton Island on the other. The bottom was clean sand. The plunge of our anchor sent up clouds of birds wheeling and crying over the woods, but in less than a minute they were down again, and all was once more silent. The place was entirely landlocked, buried in woods the trees coming right down to high water mark, the shores mostly flat, and the hilltops standing round at a distance, in a sort of amphitheatre, one here, one there. Two little rivers, or rather two swamps, emptied out into this pond, as you might call it, and the foliage around that part of the shore had a kind of poisonous brightness. From the ship we could see nothing of the house or stockade, for they were quite buried among trees, and if it had not been for the chart on the companion, we might have been the first that ever anchored there since the islands arose out of the seas. There was not a breath of air moving, nor a sound but that of the surf booming half a mile away along the beaches and against the rocks outside. A peculiar stagnant smell hung over the anchorage, a smell of sodden leaves and rotting tree-trunks. I observed the doctor sniffing and sniffing, like someone tasting a bad egg. "'I don't know about treasure,' he said, "'but I'll stick my wig. There's fever here.' If the conduct of the men had been alarming in the boat, it became truly threatening when they had come aboard. They lay about the deck, growling together in talk. The slightest order was received with a black look and grudgingly and carelessly obeyed. Even the honest hands must have caught the infection, for there was not one man aboard to mend another. Mutiny, it was plain, hung over us like a thundercloud. And it was not only we of the cabin party who perceived the danger. Long John was hard at work going from group to group, spending himself in good advice, and, and as for example, no man could have shown a better. He fairly outstripped himself in willingness and civility. He was all smiles to every one. If an order were given, John would be on his crutch in an instant, with the cheeriest, "'Aye, aye, sir!' in the world. And when there was nothing else to do, he kept up one song after another, as if to conceal the discontent of the rest. Of all the gloomy features of that gloomy afternoon, this obvious anxiety on the part of Long John appeared the worst. We held a council in the cabin. "'Sir,' said the captain, "'if I risk another order, the whole ship will come about our ears by the run. You see, sir, here it is. I get a rough answer, do I not? Well, if I speak back, pikes will be going in two shakes. If I don't, Silver will see there's something under that, and the game's up. Now we've only one man to rely on." "'And who's that?' asked the squire. "'Silver, sir,' returned the captain. 
he's as anxious as you and I to smother things up. This is a tiff. He'd soon talk em out of it if he had the chance. And what I propose to do is to give him the chance. Let's allow the men an afternoon ashore. If they all go, why, we'll fight the ship. If they none of them go, well, then, we hold the cabin, and God defend the right. If some go, you mark my words, sir, silver'll bring em aboard again, as mild as lambs. It was so decided. Loaded pistols were served out to all the shore men. Hunter, Joyce, and Redruth were taken into our confidence, and received the news with no less surprise and a better spirit than we had looked for, and then the captain went on deck and addressed the crew. "'My lads,' said he, "'we've had a hot day, and are all tired and out of sorts. A turn ashore will hurt nobody. The boats are still in the water. You can take the gigs, and as many as please can go ashore for the afternoon. I'll fire a gun half an hour before sundown. I believe the silly fellows must have thought that they would break their shins over treasure as soon as they were landed, for they all came out of their sulks in a moment, and gave a cheer that started the echo in a far-away hill, and sent the birds once more flying and squalling round the anchorage. The captain was too bright to be in the way. He whipped out of sight in a moment, leaving Silver to arrange the party, and I fancy it was as well he did so. Had he been on deck, he could no longer so much as have pretended not to understand the situation. It was as plain as day. Silver was the captain, and a mighty rebellious crew he had of it. The honest hands, and I was soon to see it proved that there were such on board, must have been very stupid fellows. Or rather, I suppose the truth was this, that all hands were disaffected by the example of the ringleaders, only some more, some less, and a few, being good fellows in the main, could neither be led nor driven any farther. It is one thing to be idle and skulk, and quite another to take a ship and murder a number of innocent men. At last, however, the party was made up. Six fellows were to stay on board, and the remaining thirteen, including Silver, began to embark. Then it was that there came into my head the first of the mad notions that contributed so much to save our lives. If six men were left by Silver, it was plain our party could not take and fight the ship, and since only six were left, it was equally plain that the cabin party had no present need of my assistance. It occurred to me at once to go ashore. In a jiffy I had slipped over the side, and curled up in the foresheets of the nearest boat, and almost at the same moment she shoved off. No one took notice of me, only the bow oar, saying, "'Is that you, Jim? Keep your head down!' But Silver, from the other boat, looked sharply over, and called out to know if that were me, and from that moment I began to regret what I had done. The crews raced for the beach, and in the boat I was in, having some start and being at once the lighter and the better manned, shot far ahead of her consort, and the bow had struck among the shoreside trees, and I had caught a branch and swung myself out and plunged into the nearest thicket, while Silver and the rest were still a hundred yards away. "'Jim! Jim!' I heard him shouting. But you may suppose I paid no heed. Jumping, ducking, and breaking through, I ran straight before my nose till I could run no longer. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 The First Blow I was so pleased at having given the slip to Long John that I began to enjoy myself and look around me with some interest on the strange land that I was in. I had crossed a marshy tract, full of willows, bulrushes, and odd, outlandish, swampy trees, and now had come out upon the skirts of an open piece of undulating, sandy country, about a mile long, dotted with a few pines, and a great number of contorted trees, not unlike the oak in growth, but pale in the foliage, like willows. 
On the far side of the open stood one of the hills, with two quaint craggy peaks shining vividly in the sun. I now felt for the first time the joy of exploration. The isle was uninhabited, but my shipmates I have left behind, and nothing lived in front of me but dumb brutes and fowls. I turned hither and thither among the trees. Here and there were flowering plants unknown to me. Here and there I saw snakes, and one raised his head from a ledge of rock and hissed at me with a noise not unlike the spinning of a top. Little did I suppose that he was a deadly enemy, and the noise was the famous rattle. Then I came to a long thicket of these oak-like trees, live or evergreen oaks I heard afterward they should be called, which grew low along the sand like brambles, the boughs curiously twisted, the foliage compact like thatch. The thicket stretched down from the top of one of the sandy knolls, spreading and growing taller as it went, until it reached the margin of the broad reedy fen through which the nearest of the little rivers soaked its way into the anchorage. The marsh was streaming in the strong sun, and the outline of the spyglass trembled through the haze. All at once there began to go a sort of bustle among the bulrushes. A wild duck flew up with a quack, another followed, and soon over the whole surface of the marsh a great cloud of birds hung screaming and circling in the air. I judged at once that some of my shipmates must be drawing near along the borders of the fen. Nor was I deceived, for soon I heard the very distant and low tones of a human voice, which, as I continued to give ear, grew steadily louder and nearer. This put me in great fear, and I crawled under cover of the nearest live oak, and squatted there, hearkening, as silent as a mouse. Another voice answered, and then the first voice, which I now recognized to be Silver's, once more took up the story and ran on for a long while in a stream, only now and again interrupted by the other. By the sound they must have been talking earnestly and almost fiercely, but no distinct word came to my hearing. At last the speakers seemed to have paused, and perhaps to have sat down, for not only did they cease to draw any nearer, but the birds themselves began to grow more quiet, and to settle again into their places in the swamp. And now I began to feel that I was neglecting my business, that since I had been so foolhardy as to come ashore with these desperadoes, the least I could do was to overhear them at their councils, and that my plain and obvious duty was to draw as close as I could manage under the favourable ambush of the crouching trees. I could tell the direction of the speakers pretty exactly, not only by the sound of their voices, but by the behaviour of the few birds that still hung in alarm above the heads of the intruders. Crawling on all fours, I made steadily but slowly towards them, till at last, raising my head to an aperture among the leaves, I could see clear down into a little green dell beside the marsh, and closely set about with trees where Long John Silver and another of the crew stood face to face in conversation. The sun beat full upon them. Silver had thrown his hat beside him on the ground, and his great smooth blond face, all shining with heat, was lifted to the other man's in a kind of appeal. Mate, he was saying, that's because I thinks gold dust of you, gold dust, and you may lay to that, and if I hadn't took to you like pitch, do you think I'd have been here a warning of you? All's up. You can't make nor mend. It's to save your neck that I'm a-speaking, and if one of the wild uns knew it, where'd I be, Tom? Now tell me, where'd I be? Silver, said the other man, and I observed he was not only red in the face, but spoke as hoarse as a crow and his voice shook, too, like a taut rope. "'Silver,' says he, "'you're old, and you're honest, or has the name of it, and you've money, too, which lots of poor sailors hasn't, and you're brave, or I'm mistook. And will you tell me you'll let yourself be led away with that kind of a mess of swabs? Not you. As sure as God sees me, I'd sooner lose my hand, if I turn again my duty." And then, all of a sudden, he was interrupted by a noise, 
I had found one of the honest hands. Well, here at that same moment came news of another. Far away out in the marsh there arose all of a sudden a sound like the cry of anger, then another on the back of it, and then one horrid, long-drawn scream. The rocks of the spyglass re-echoed it a score of times. The whole troop of marsh-birds rose again, darkening heaven with a simultaneous whirr, and long after that death-yell was still ringing in my brain, silence had re-established its empire, and only the rustle of the redescending birds and the boom of the distant surges disturbed the languor of the afternoon. Tom had leapt at the sound, like a horse at the spur, but Silver had not winked an eye. He stood where he was, resting lightly on his crutch, watching his companion like a snake about to spring. "'John!' said the sailor, stretching out his hand. "'Hands off!' cried Silver, leaping back a yard, as it seemed to me, with the speed and security of a trained gymnast. "'Hands off, if you like, John Silver,' said the other. "'It's a black conscience that can make you fear of me, but in heaven's name tell me what was that?' "'That?' returned Silver, smiling away, but warier than ever, his eye a mere pinpoint in his big face, but gleaming like a crumb of glass. "'That? Oh, I reckon that would be Alan!' And at this poor Tom flashed out like a hero. "'Alan!' he cried. "'Then rest his soul for a true seaman. And as for you, John Silver, long you've been a mate of mine, but you're a mate of mine no longer. If I die like a dog, I'll die in my duty. You've killed Alan, have you? Kill me too if you can, but I defies you.' And with that this brave fellow turned his back directly on the cook, and set off walking for the beach. But he was not destined to go far. With a cry John seized the branch of a tree, whipped the crutch out of his armpit, and sent that uncouth missile hurling through the air. It struck poor Tom point foremost, and with stunning violence, right between the shoulders in the middle of his back. His hands flew up, and he gave a sort of gasp and fell. Whether he was injured much or little, none could ever tell. Like enough, to judge from the sound, his back was broken on the spot. But he had no time given him to recover. Silver, agile as a monkey, even without leg or crutch, was on the top of him next moment, and had twice buried his knife up to the hilt in that defenceless body. From my place of ambush I could hear him pant aloud as he struck the blows. I do not know what it rightly is to faint. But I do know that for the next little while the whole world swam away from before me in a whirling mist. Silver and the birds and the tall spyglass hilltop going round and round and topsy-turvy before my eyes, and all manner of bells ringing and distant voices shouting in my ear. When I came again to myself the monster had pulled himself together, his crutch under his arm, his hat upon his head. Just before him Tom lay motionless upon the sward, but the murderer minded him not a whit, cleansing his blood-stained knife the while upon a wisp of grass. Everything else was unchanged, the sun still shining mercilessly upon the steaming marsh, and the tall pinnacle of the mountain, and I could scarcely persuade myself that the murder had actually been done, and a human life cruelly cut short a moment since before my eyes. And now John put his hand into his pocket, brought out a whistle, and blew upon it several modulated blasts that rang far across the heated air. I could not tell, of course, the meaning of the signal, but it instantly awoke my fears. More men would be coming. I might be discovered. They had already slain two of the honest people. After Tom and Alan, might not I come next? Instantly I began to extricate myself, and crawl back again, with what speed and silence I could manage, to the more open portion of the wood. And as I did so I could hear hails coming and going between the old buccaneer and his comrades, and this sound of danger lent me wings. 
As soon as I was clear of the thicket, I ran as I never ran before, scarce minding the direction of my flight, so long as it led me from the murderers, and as I ran fear grew and grew upon me, until it turned into a kind of frenzy. Indeed, could any one be more entirely lost than I? When the gun fired, how should I dare to go down to the boats among those fiends, still smoking from their crime? Would not the first of them who saw me wring my neck like a snipe's? Would not my absence itself be an evidence to them of my alarm, and therefore of my fatal knowledge? It was all over, I thought. Good-bye to the Hispaniola, good-bye to the squire, the doctor, and the captain. There was nothing left for me but death by starvation, or death by the hands of the mutineers. All this while, as I say, I was still running, and without taking any notice, I had drawn near to the foot of the little hill with the two peaks, and had got into a part of the island where the wild oaks grew more widely apart, and seemed more like forest trees in their bearing and dimensions. Mingled with these there were a few scattered pines, some fifty, some nearer seventy feet high. The air, too, smelled more fresh than down beside the marsh and here a fresh alarm brought me to a standstill with a thumping heart. End of chapter 14 Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 15 The Man of the Island From the side of the hill, which was here steep and stony, a spout of gravel was dislodged, and fell rattling and bounding through the trees. My eyes turned instinctively in that direction, and I saw a figure leap with great rapidity behind the trunk of a pine. What it was, whether bare, or man, or monkey, I could in no wise tell. It seemed dark and shaggy, more I knew not, but the terror of this new apparition brought me to a stand. I was now, it seemed, cut off upon both sides, behind me the murderers, before me this lurking nondescript, and immediately I began to prefer the dangers that I knew to those I knew not. Silver himself appeared less terrible in contrast with this creature of the woods, and I turned on my heel, and looking sharply behind me over my shoulder, began to retrace my steps in the direction of the boats. Instantly the figure reappeared, and, making a wide circuit, began to head me off. I was tired. At any rate, but had I been as fresh as when I rose, I could see it was in vain for me to contend in speed with such an adversary. From trunk to trunk the creature flitted like a deer, running man-like on two legs, but unlike any man that I had ever seen, stooping almost double as it ran. Yet a man it was, I could no longer be in doubt about that. I began to recall what I had heard of cannibals. I was with an ace of calling for help, but the mere fact that he was a man, however wild, had somewhat reassured me and my fear of silver began to revive in proportion. I stood still, therefore, and cast about for some method of escape, and as I was so thinking the recollection of my pistol flashed into my mind. As soon as I remembered I was not defenceless, courage glowed again in my heart, and I set my face resolutely for this man of the island, and walked briskly toward him. He was concealed by this time behind another tree-trunk, but he must have been watching me closely, for as soon as I began to move in his direction he reappeared and took a step to meet me. Then he hesitated, drew back, came forward again, and at last, to my wonder and confusion, threw himself on his knees and held out his clasped hands in supplication. At that I once more stopped. "'Who are you?' I asked. "'Ben Gunn,' he answered and his voice sounded hoarse and awkward, like a rusty lock. "'I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am. 
and I haven't spoke with a Christian these three years. I could now see that he was a white man like myself, and that his features were even pleasing. His skin, wherever it was exposed, was burned by the sun. Even his lips were black, and his fair eyes looked quite startling in so dark a face. Of all the beggar men that I had seen or fancied, he was the chief for raggedness. He was clothed with tatters of old ship's canvas and old sea-cloth, and this extraordinary patchwork was all held together by a system of the most various and incongruous fastenings—brass buttons, bits of stick, and loops of tarry gaskin. About his waist he wore an old brass-buckled leather belt, which was the one thing solid in his old accoutrement. Three years?' I cried. "'Were you shipwrecked?' "'Nay, mate,' said he, "'marooned.' I had heard that word, and I knew it stood for a horrible kind of punishment, common enough among the buccaneers, in which the offender is put ashore with a little powder and shot, and left behind on some desolate and distant island. "'Marooned three years agone,' he continued and lived on goats since then, and berries and oysters. Wherever a man is, says I, a man can do for himself. But, mate, my heart is sore for Christian diet. You mayn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you now. No, well, many's the long night I've dreamed of cheese, toasted mostly, and woke up again, and here I were. If ever I can get aboard again, said I, you shall have cheese by the stone. At this time he had been feeling the stuff of my jacket, smoothing my hands, looking at my boots, and generally in the intervals of his speech showing a childish pleasure in the presence of a fellow creature. But at my last words he perked up into a kind of startled slyness. "'If ever you get aboard again, says you,' he repeated, "'why now, who's to hinder you?' "'Not you, I know,' was my reply. "'Oh, and right you was,' he cried. "'Now you, what do you call yourself, mate?' "'Jim,' I told him. "'Jim, Jim,' says he, quite pleased, apparently. "'Well, now, Jim, I've lived that rough as you'd be ashamed to hear of. Now, for instance, you wouldn't think I had had a pious mother to look at me?' he asked. "'Why, uh, no, not in particular,' I answered. "'Ah, well,' said he, "'but I had remarkably pious, and I was a civil pious boy, and could rattle off my catechism that fast you couldn't tell one word from another. And here's what it come to, Jim, and it begun with Chuck Farthen on the blessed gravestones.' That's what it begun with, and it went farther than that, and so my mother told me and predicted the whole she did, the pious woman. But it were a providence that put me here. I've thought it all out in this here lonely island, and I'm back on piety. You can't catch me tasting rum so much, but just a thimbleful for luck, of course, the first chance I have. I'm bound I'll be good, and I see the way to. And Jim, looking all round him and lowering his voice to a whisper, I'm rich. I now felt sure that the poor fellow had gone crazy in his solitude, and I suppose I must have shown the feeling in my face, for he repeated the statement hotly. Rich, rich, I says, and I'll tell you what— "'I'll make a man of you, Jim. Ah, oh, Jim, you'll bless your stars, you will. You was the first that found me.' And at this there came suddenly a lowering shadow over his face, and he tightened his grasp upon my hand, and raised a forefinger threateningly before my eyes. "'Now, Jim, you tell me true. That ain't Flint's ship?' he asked. At this I had a happy inspiration. I began to believe that I had found an ally, and I answered him at once. "'It's not Flint's ship, and Flint is dead. But I'll tell you true, but I'll tell you true, as you ask me. There are some of Flint's hands aboard. Worst luck for the rest of us.' 
"'Not a man with one leg,' he gasped. "'Silver?' I asked. "'Ah, oh, Silver,' says he. "'That were his name. "'He's the cook, and the ringleader, too.' He was still holding me by the wrist, and at that he gave it quite a ring. "'If you were sent by Long John,' he said, "'I'm as good as pork, and I know it. "'But where was you, do you suppose?' I had made up my mind in a moment, and by way of answer told him the whole story of our voyage and the predicament in which we found ourselves. He heard me with the keenest interest, and when I had done he patted me on the head. "'You're a good lad, Jim,' he said, "'and you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? Well, you just put your trust in Ben Gunn. Ben Gunn's the man to do it. Would you think it likely now that your squire would prove a liberal-minded one in case of help, him being in a clove hitch, as you remark? I told him the squire was the most liberal of men. Ah, but you see, returned Ben Gunn, I didn't mean giving me a gate to keep but a suit of livery clothes and such. That's not my mark, Jim. What I mean is, would he be likely to come down to the tune of, say, one thousand pounds out of money that's as good as a man's own already? I'm sure he would, said I. As it is, all hands were to share. And a passage home, he added, with a look of great shrewdness. Why, I cried, the squire's a gentleman, and besides, if we got rid of the others, we should want you to help work the vessel home. Oh, said he, so you would, and he seemed very much relieved. Now, I'll tell you what, he went on, so much I'll tell you and no more. I were in Flint's ship when he buried the treasure, he and six along, six strong seamen. They was ashore nigh on a week, and us standing off and on in the old walrus. One fine day up went the signal, and here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and his head done up in a blue scarf. The sun was getting up, and mortal white he looked about the cutwater. But there he was, you mind, and the six all dead dead and buried. How had he done it? Not a man a us could make out. It was battle, murder, and sudden death, leastways, him against six. Billy Bones was the mate. Long Johnny was quartermaster, and they asked him where the treasure was. Ah, he says, you can go ashore if you like and stay, he says. But as for the ship, she'll be up for more by thunder. That's what he said. Well, I was in another ship three years back, and we sighted this island. Boys, said I, here's Flint's treasure. Let's land and find it. The captain was displeased at that, but my messmates were all of a mind and landed. Twelve days they looked for it, and every day they had the worst word for me, until one fine morning all hands went aboard. As for you, Benjamin Gunn, says they, here's a musket, they says, and a spade and a pickaxe. You can stay here and find Flint's money for yourself, they says. Well, Jim, three years have I been here, and not a bite of Christian diet from that day to this. But now you look here, look at me. Do I look like a man before the mast? No, says you, nor I weren't neither, I says. And with that he winked and pinched me hard. "'Just you mention them words to your squire, Jim,' he went on. "'Nor he weren't neither. That's the words. Three years he were the man of this island, light and dark, fair and rain, and sometimes he would, maybe, 
think upon a prayer says you and sometimes he would maybe think of his old mother so be as she's alive you'll say but the most part of gun's time this is what you'll say the most part of his time was took up with another matter and then you'll give him a nip like i do and he pinched me again in the most confidential manner then he continued then you'll up and you'll say this gun is a good man you'll say and he puts a precious sight more confidence a precious sight mind that in a gentleman born than in these gentlemen of fortune having been one hisself well i said i don't understand one word that you've been saying but that's neither here nor there for how am i to get on board ah said he that's the hitch for sure well there's my boat that i made with my two hands i keep her under the white rock if the worst come to the worst we might try that after dark hi he broke out what's that for just then although the sun had still an hour or two to run all the echoes of the island awoke and bellowed to the thunder of a cannon they have begun to fight i cried follow me and i began to run toward the anchorage my terrors all forgotten while close at my side the marooned man in his goatskins trotted easily and lightly left left says he keep to your left hand mate jim under the trees with you that's where i killed my first goat they don't come down here now they're all mast-headed on their mountains for the fear of benjamin gunn ah and there's the cemetery cemetery he must have meant you see the mounds i come here and prayed nows and thens when i thought maybe a sunday would be about do it weren't quite a chapel but it seemed more solemn like and then says you ben gunn was short-handed no chaplain nor so much as a bible and a flag says you so he kept talking as i ran neither expecting nor receiving any answer the cannon shot was followed after a considerable interval by a volley of small arms another pause and then not a quarter of a mile in front of me i beheld the union jack flutter in the air above a wood end of chapter fifteen part four the stockade chapter sixteen narrative continued by the doctor how the ship was abandoned it was about half past one three bells in the sea phrase that the two boats went ashore from the hispaniola the captain the squire and i were talking matters over in the cabin had there been a breath of wind we should have fallen on the six mutineers who were left aboard with us slipped our cable and away to sea but the wind was wanting and to complete our helplessness down came hunter with the news that jim hawkins had slipped into a boat and was gone ashore with the rest it had never occurred to us to doubt jim hawkins but we were alarmed for his safety with the men in the temper they were in it seemed an even chance if we should see the lad again we ran on deck the pitch was bubbling in the seams the nasty stench of the place turned me sick if ever a man smelled fever and dysentery it was in that abominable anchorage the six scoundrels were sitting grumbling under a sail in the forecastle ashore we could see the gigs had made fast and a man sitting in each hard by where the river runs in one of them was whistling lily bolero waiting was a strain and it was decided that hunter and i should go ashore with the jolly boat in quest of information the gigs had leaned to their right but hunter and i pulled straight in in the direction of the stockade upon the chart the two who were left guarding their boats seemed in a bustle at our appearance lily bolero stopped off and i could see the pair discussing what they ought to do had they gone and told silver all might have turned out differently but they had their orders i suppose and decided to sit quietly where they were and hark back again to lily bolero there was a slight bend in the coast and i steered so as to put it between us even before we had landed we had thus lost sight of the gigs i jumped out and came as near running as i durst 
with a big silk handkerchief under my hat for coolness' sake, and a brace of pistols ready primed for safety. I had not gone a hundred yards when I came on the stockade. This was how it was. A spring of clear water arose at the top of a knoll. Well, on the knoll, and enclosing the spring, they had clapped a stout log-house, fit to hold two score people in a pinch, and loopholed for musketry on every side. All around this they had cleared a wide space, and then the thing was completed by a paling six feet high, without door or opening, too strong to pull down without time and labour, and too open to shelter the besiegers. The people in the log-house had them in every way. They stood quiet in the shelter, and shot the others like partridges. All they wanted was a good watch and food, for, short of a complete surprise, they might have held the place against a regiment. What particularly took my fancy was the spring, for though we had a good place of it, the cabin of the Hispaniola, with plenty of arms and ammunition, and things to eat and excellent wines, there was one thing overlooked. We had no water. I was thinking this over when there came, ringing over the island, the cry of a man at the point of death. I was not new to violent death. I have served His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cumberland, and got a wound myself at Fontenoy. But I know my pulse went jot and carry one. Jim Hawkins is gone, was my first thought. It is something to have been an old soldier, but more still to have been a doctor. There is no time to dilly-dally in our work, and so now I made up my mind instantly, and with no time lost returned to the shore and jumped on board the jolly-boat. By good fortune Hunter pulled a good oar. We made the water fly, and the boat was soon alongside and I aboard the schooner. I found them all shaken, as was natural. The squire was sitting down as white as a sheet, thinking of the harm he had led us to, the good soul, and one of the six forecastle hands was little better. "'There's a man,' said Captain Smollett, nodding towards him, "'new to this work. He came nigh-hand fainting, doctor, when he heard the cry, another touch of the rudder, and that man would join us.' I told my plan to the captain, and between us we settled on the details of its accomplishment. We put old Redruth in the gallery between the cabin and the forecastle, with three or four loaded muskets and a mattress for protection. Hunter brought the boat round under the stern port, and Joyce and I set to work loading her with powder, tins, muskets, bags of biscuit, kegs of pork, a cask of cognac, and my invaluable medicine chest. In the meantime the squire and the captain stayed on the deck and the latter hailed the coxswain, who was the principal man aboard. "'Mr. Hands,' he said, "'there are two of us with a brace of pistols each. If any one of you six make a signal of any description, that man's dead.' They were a good deal taken back, and after a little consultation, one and all tumbled down the fore companion, thinking, no doubt, to take us on the rear. But when they saw Redruth waiting for them in the sparred gallery, they went about ship at once, and a head popped out again on deck. "'Down, dog!' cried the captain. And the head popped back again, and we heard no more for the time of these six very faint-hearted seamen. By this time, tumbling things in as they came, we had the jolly boat loaded as much as we dared. Joyce and I got out through the stern port, and we made for shore again as fast as oars could take us. This second trip fairly aroused the watchers along shore. Lily Bolero was dropped again, and just before we lost sight of them behind the little point, one of them whipped ashore and disappeared. I had half a mind to change my plan and destroy their boats, but I feared that Silver and the others might be close at hand, and all might very well be lost by trying for too much. We had soon touched land in the same place as before, and set to work to provision the blockhouse. All three made the first journey, heavily laden, and tossed our stores over the palisade. Then, leaving Joyce to guard them, one man to be sure, but with half a dozen muskets, Hunter and I returned to the jolly-boat and loaded ourselves once more. So we proceeded, without pausing to take breath, till the whole cargo was bestowed, 
when the two servants took up their position in the blockhouse, and I, with all my powder, sculled back to the Hispaniola. That we should have risked a second boat-load seems more daring than it really was. They had the advantage of numbers, of course, but we had the advantage of arms. Not one of the men ashore had a musket, and before they could get within range for pistol-shooting, we flattered ourselves we should be able to give a good account of a half-dozen at least. The squire was waiting for me at the stern window, all his faintness gone from him. He caught the painter and made it fast, and we fell to loading the boat for our very lives. Pork, powder, and biscuit was the cargo, with only a musket and a cutlass apiece for squire and me, and Red Ruth and the captain. The rest of the arms and powder we dropped overboard in two fathoms and a half of water, so that we could see the bright steel shining far below us in the sun on the clean, sandy bottom. By this time the tide was beginning to ebb, and the ship was swinging round to her anchor. Voices were heard faintly hallowing in the direction of the two gigs, and though this reassured us for Joyce and Hunter, who were well to the eastward, it warned our party to be off. Redruth retreated from his place in the gallery and dropped into the boat, which we then brought round to the ship's counter to be handier for Captain Smollett. "'Now, men,' said he, "'do you hear me?' There was no answer from the forecastle. "'It's to you, Abraham Gray, it's to you I am speaking.' Still no reply. "'Gray,' resumed Mr. Smollett, a little louder, "'I am leaving this ship, and I order you to follow your captain. I know you are a good man at bottom, and I dare say not one of the lot of you as bad as he makes out. I have my watch here in my hand. I give you thirty seconds to join me in. Come, my fine fellow, continued the captain, don't hang so long in stays. I'm risking my life and the lives of these good gentlemen every second. There was a sudden scuffle, a sound of blows, and out burst Abraham Gray, with a knife cut on the side of the cheek, and came running to the captain like a dog to the whistle. "'I'm with you, sir,' he said, and the next moment he and the captain had dropped aboard of us, and we had shoved off and given way. We were clear out of the ship, but not yet ashore in our stockade. End of chapter 16 Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 17. Narrative continued by the Doctor. The Jolly Boat's Last Trip. This fifth trip was quite different from any of the others. In the first place the little galley pot of a boat that we were in was gravely overloaded. Five grown men, and three of them, Trelawney, Redruth, and the captain, over six feet high, was already more than she was meant to carry. Add to that the powder, pork, and the bread-bags. The gunwales were lipping astern. Several times we shipped a little water, and my breeches and the tails of my coat were all soaking wet before we had got a hundred yards. The captain made us trim the boat, and we got her to lie a little more evenly. All the same we were afraid to breathe. In the second place the ebb was now making, a strong rippling current running westward through the basin, and then southward and seaward down the straits by which we had entered in the morning. Even the ripples were a danger to our overloaded craft, but the worst of it was that we were swept out of our true course, and away from our proper landing-place behind the point. If we let the current have its way we should come ashore beside the gigs where the pirates might appear at any moment. "'I cannot keep her head for the stockade, sir,' said I to the captain. I was steering while he and Redruth, two fresh men, were at the oars. The tide keeps washing her down. Could you pull a little stronger?" "'Not without swamping the boat,' said he. "'You must bear up, sir, if you please, bear up, until you see your gaining.' I tried, and found by experiment that the tide kept sweeping us westward, 
till I had laid her head due east, or just about right angles to the way we ought to go. "'We'll never get ashore at this rate,' said I. "'If it's the only course we can lie, sir, we must even lie it,' returned the captain. "'We must keep upstream, you see, sir,' he went on. "'If once we drop to leeward of the landing-place, it's hard to say where we should get ashore, besides the chance of being boarded by the gigs. Whereas the way we go the current must slacken, and then we can dodge back along the shore." "'The current's less already, sir,' said the man Gray, who was sitting in the foresheets. "'You can ease her off a bit.' "'Thank you, my man,' said I, as if nothing had happened for we had all quietly made up our minds to treat him like one of ourselves. Suddenly the captain spoke up again, and I thought his voice was a little changed. "'The gun!' said he. "'I have thought of that,' said I, for I made sure he was thinking of a bombardment of the fort. They could never get the gun ashore, and if they did they could never haul it through the woods. "'Look astern, doctor,' replied the captain. We had entirely forgotten the long nine, and there, to our horror, were the five rogues busy about her, getting off her jacket, as they called the stout tarpaulin cover under which she sailed. Not only that, but it flashed into my mind at the same moment that the round shot and the powder for the gun had been left behind, and the stroke of an axe would put it all into the possession of the evil ones aboard. "'Israel was Flint's gunner,' said Gray, hoarsely. At any risk we put the boat's head directly for the landing-place. By this time we had got so far out of the run of the current that we kept steerage way even at our necessarily gentle rate of rowing, and I could keep her steady for the goal. But the worst of it was that, with the course I now held, we turned our broadside instead of our stern to the Hispaniola, and offered a target like a barn door. I could hear, as well as see, that brandy-faced rascal, Israel Hands, plumping down a round shot on the deck. "'Who's the best shot?' asked the captain. "'Mr. Trelawney, out and away,' said I. "'Mr. Trelawney, will you please pick me off one of those men, sir? Hands, if possible,' said the captain. Trelawney was as cold as steel. He looked to the priming of his gun. "'Now,' cried the captain, "'easy with that gun, sir, or you'll swamp the boat. All hands stand by to trim her when he aims.' The squire raised his gun, the rowing ceased, and we leaned over to the other side to keep the balance, and all was so nicely contrived that we did not ship a drop. They had the gun by this time slewed around upon the swivel, and Hans, who was at the muzzle with the rammer, was in consequence the most exposed. However, we had no luck, for just as Trelawney fired, down he stooped, the ball whistling over him, and it was one of the other four who fell. The cry he gave was echoed not only by his companions on board, but by a great number of voices from the shore and looking out in that direction I saw the other pirates trooping out from among the trees and tumbling into their places in the boats. "'Here come the gigs, sir,' said I. "'Give way, then,' said the captain. "'We mustn't mind if we swamp her now. If we can't get ashore, all's up.' "'Only one of the gigs is being manned, sir,' I added. "'The crew of the other is most likely going around by shore to cut us off.' "'They'll have a hot run, sir,' returned the captain. "'Jack ashore, you know. If it's not to them I mind, it's the round shot. "'Carpet bowls! My lady's maid couldn't miss. Tell us, squire, when you see the match, and we'll hold water.' In the meantime we had been making headway at a good pace for a boat so overloaded, and we had shipped but little water in the process. We were now close in. Thirty or forty strokes, and we should beach her, for the ebb had already disclosed a narrow belt of sand below the clustering trees. The gig was no longer to be feared. The little point had already concealed it from our eyes. The ebb tide, which had so cruelly delayed us, was now making reparation and delaying our assailants. 
the one source of danger was the gun. "'If I durst,' said the captain, "'I'd stop and pick off another man.' It was plain that they meant nothing should delay their shot. They had never so much as looked at their fallen comrade, though he was not dead, and I could see him trying to crawl away. "'Ready!' cried the squire. "'Hold!' cried the captain, quick as an echo, and he and Redruth backed with a great heave that sent her astern bodily under water. The report fell into the same instant of time. This was the first that Jim heard, the sound of the squire's shot not having reached him. When the ball passed, not one of us precisely knew, but I fancy it must have been over our heads, and that the wind of it may have contributed to our disaster. At any rate, the boat sunk by the stern, quite gently, in three feet of water, leaving the captain and myself facing each other on our feet. The other three took complete headers, and came up again drenched and bubbling. So far there was no great harm. No lives were lost, and we could wade ashore in safety. But there were all our stores at the bottom, and to make things worse, only two guns out of five remained in a state for service. Mine I had snatched from my knees, and held over my head by a sort of instinct. As for the captain, he had carried his over his shoulder by a bandolier, and, like a wise man, lock uppermost. The other three had gone down with the boat. To add to our concern, we heard voices already drawing near to us in the wood along the shore, and we had only the danger of being cut off from the stockade in our half-crippled state, but the fear before us, whether, if Hunter and Joyce were attacked by half a dozen, they would have the sense and conduct to stand firm. Hunter was steady, that we knew. Joyce was a doubtful case. A pleasant, polite man for a valet, and to brush one's clothes, but not entirely fitted for a man of war. With all this in our minds we waded ashore as fast as we could, leaving behind us the poor jolly-boat and a good half of all our powder and provisions. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Narrative continued by the Doctor End of the first day's fighting We made our best speed across the strip of wood that now divided us from the stockade, and at every step we took the voices of the buccaneers rang nearer. Soon we could hear their footfalls as they ran, and the cracking of the branches as they breasted across a bit of thicket. I began to see we should have a brush for it in earnest, and looked to my priming. "'Captain,' said I, "'Trelawney is the dead shot. Give him your gun. His own is useless.' They exchanged guns, and Trelawney, silent and cool as he had been since the beginning of the bustle, hung a moment on his heel to see that all was fit for service. At the same time, observing Gray to be unarmed, I handed him my cutlass. It did all our hearts good to see him spit in his hand, knit his brows, and make the blade sing through the air. It was plain from every line of his body that our new hand was worth his salt. Forty paces farther we came to the edge of the wood, and saw the stockade in front of us. We struck the enclosure about the middle of the south side, and almost at the same time seven mutineers, Job Anderson the boatswain at their head, appeared in full cry at the southwestern corner. They paused, as if taken aback, and before they recovered not only the squire and I, but Hunter and Joyce from the blockhouse had time to fire. The four shots came in rather a scattering volley, but they did the business. One of the enemy actually fell, and the rest, without hesitation, turned and plunged into the trees. After reloading, we walked down the outside of the palisade to see the fallen enemy. He was stone dead, shot through the heart. We began to rejoice over our good success, when just at that moment a pistol cracked in the bush, and a ball whistled close past my ear, and poor Tom Redruth stumbled and fell his length on the ground. Both the squire and I returned the shot, but as we had nothing to aim at, it was probable we only wasted powder. Then we reloaded, and turned our attention to poor Tom. The captain and Gray were already examining him, and I saw with half an eye that all was over. 
I believe the readiness of our return volley had scattered the mutineers once more, for we were suffered without further molestation to get the poor old gamekeeper hoisted over the stockade and carried, groaning and bleeding, into the log-house. Poor old fellow! He had not uttered one word of surprise, complaint, fear, or even acquiescence from the very beginning of our troubles till now, when we had laid him down on the log-house to die. He had lain like a Trojan behind his mattress in the gallery. He had followed every order, silently, doggedly, and well. He was the oldest of our party by a score of years, and now, sullen, old, serviceable servant, it was he that was to die. The squire dropped down beside him on his knees and kissed his hand, crying like a child. "'Be I going, doctor?' he asked. "'Tom, my man,' said I, "'you're going home.' "'I wish I had had a lick at em with the gun first. he replied. "'Tom,' said the squire, "'say you forgive me, won't you? "'Would that be respectful like from me to you, squire?' was the answer. "'Howsoever it be, amen.' After a little while of silence he said he thought somebody might read a prayer. "'It's the custom, sir.' he added apologetically, and not long after, without another word, he passed away. In the meantime the captain, whom I had observed to be wonderfully swollen about the chest and pockets, had turned out a great many various stores—the British colours, a Bible, a coil of stoutish rope, pen, ink, the log-book, and pounds of tobacco. He had found a longish fir-tree lying felled and cleared in the enclosure, and, with the help of Hunter, he had set it up at the corner of the log-house, where the trunks crossed and made an angle. Then, climbing up on the roof, he had with his own hand bent and run up the colours. This seemed mightily to relieve him. He re-entered the log-house and set about counting up the stores as if nothing else existed but he had an eye on Tom's passage for all that, and as soon as all was over came forward with another flag, and reverently spread it on the body. "'Don't you take on, sir,' he said, shaking the squire's hand. "'All's well with him. No fear for a hand that's been shot down in his duty to captain and owner. It mayn't be good divinity, but it's a fact.' Then he pulled me aside. "'Dr. Livesey,' he said, "'in how many weeks do you and Squire expect the consort?' I told him it was a question not of weeks, but of months. That if we were not back by the end of August, Blandley was to send to find us, but neither sooner nor later. "'You can calculate for yourself,' I said. "'Why, yes,' returned the captain, scratching his head. And making a large allowance, sir, for all the gifts of Providence, I should say we were pretty close-hauled. How do you mean? I asked. It's a pity, sir, we lost that second load. That's what I mean, replied the captain. As for powder and shot, we'll do. But the rations are short, very short. So short, Dr. Livesey, that we're perhaps as well without that extra mouth." And he pointed to the dead body under the flag. Just then, with a roar and a whistle, a round-shot passed high above the roof of the log-house, and plumped far beyond us in the wood. Oh ho said the captain. "'Blaze away! You've lit enough powder already, my lads!' At the second trial the aim was better, and the ball descended inside the stockade, scattering a cloud of sand, but doing no further damage. "'Captain,' said the squire, "'the house is quite invisible from the ship. It must be the flag they're aiming at. Would it not be wiser to take it in?' "'Strike my colours!' cried the captain. "'No, sir, not I!' And as soon as he had said the word I think we all agreed with him for it was not only a piece of stout, seemingly good feeling, it was a good policy besides, and showed our enemies that we despised their cannonade. All through the evening they kept thundering away. Ball after ball flew over or fell short, 
or kicked up the sand in the enclosure but they had to fire so high that the shot fell dead and buried itself in the soft sand. We had no ricochet to fear, and though one popped in through the roof of the log-house and out again through the floor, we soon got used to that sort of horse-play, and minded it no more than cricket. "'There is one good thing about all this,' observed the captain. "'The wood in front of us is likely clear. The ebb has made a good while, our stores should be uncovered. Volunteers to go and bring in pork. Gray and Hunter were the first to come forward. Well armed, they stole out of the stockade, but it proved a useless mission. The mutineers were bolder than we fancied, or they put more trust in Israel's gunnery, for four or five of them were busy carrying off our stores and wading out with them to one of the gigs that lay close by, pulling an oar or so to hold her steady against the current. Silver was in the stern sheets in command, and every man of them was now provided with a musket from some secret magazine of their own. The captain sat down to his log, and here is the beginning of the entry. Alexander Smollett master david livesey ship's doctor abraham gray carpenter's mate john trelawney owner john hunter and richard joyce owner's servants landsmen being all that is left faithful of the ship's company with stores for ten days at short rations came ashore this day and flew british colours on the log house in treasure island thomas redruth owner's servant, landsman, shot by the mutineers, James Hawkins, cabin boy, and at the same time I was wondering over poor Jim Hawkins' fate. A hail on the land side. "'Somebody hailing us,' said Hunter, who was on guard. "'Doctor, squire, captain, hello, Hunter, is that you?' came the cries. And I ran to the door in time to see Jim Hawkins, safe and sound, come climbing over the stockade. End of chapter 18 Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Adrian Pretzelis Chapter 19 Narrative resumed by Jim Hawkins The Garrison in the Stockade As soon as Ben Gunn saw the colours he came to a halt, stopped me by the arm, and sat down. "'Now,' says he, "'there's your friends, sure enough.' "'Far more likely it's the mutineers,' I answered. "'That,' uh, he cried. Why, in a place like this, where nobody puts in but gentlemen of fortune, silver would fly the jolly Roger, you don't make no doubt of that. No, that's your friends. There's been blows, too, and I reckon your friends has had the best of it. And here they are ashore, in the old stockade, as was made years and years ago by Flint. Ah, he was the man to have a headpiece, was Flint. Barring rum, his match was never seen. He were afraid of none, not he, only silver. Silver was that genteel. Well, said I, that may be so, and so be it, all the more reason that I should hurry on and join my friends. Nay, mate, returned Ben, not you. You're a good boy, or I'm mistook. But you're only a boy, all told. Now Ben Gunn is fly. Rum wouldn't bring me there where you're going. Now rum wouldn't, till I see your born gentleman and gets it on his word of honour. And you won't forget my words. A precious sight, that's what you'll say. A precious sight more confidence. And then nips him. And he pinched me the third time with the same air of cleverness. And when Ben Gunn is wanted, you know where to find him, Jim, just where you found him to-day. And him that comes is to have a white thing in his hand, and he's to come alone. Oh, and you'll say this, 
Ben Gunn, says you, has reasons of his own. Well, said I, I believe I understand. You have something to propose, and you wish to see the squire or the doctor, and you're to be found where I found you. Is that all? And when, says you, he added, why, from about noon observation to about six bells. Good, says I. And now may I go? You won't forget, he inquired anxiously. Precious sight and reasons of his own, says you. Reasons of his own, that's the mainstay, as between man and man. Well, then, still holding me, I reckon you can go, Jim. And, Jim, if you was to see silver, you wouldn't go for to sell Ben Gunn. Wild horses wouldn't draw it from you. No, says you. And if them pirates came ashore, Jim, what would you say? But there'd be widders in the morning. Here he was interrupted by a loud report, and a cannon ball came tearing through the trees and pitched in in the sand, not a hundred yards from where we two were talking. The next moment each of us had taken to our heels in a different direction. For a good hour to come, frequent reports shook the island, and balls kept crashing through the woods. I moved from hiding place to hiding place, always pursued, or so it seemed to me, by these terrifying missiles. But toward the end of the bombardment, though still I durst not venture in the direction of the stockade, where the balls fell oftenest, I had begun in a manner to pluck up my heart again, and after a long detour in the east crept down among the shoreside trees. The sun had just set, the sea-breeze was rustling and tumbling in the woods, and ruffling the grey surface of the anchorage, and tide too was far out, and great tracks of sand lay uncovered. The air, after the heat of the day, chilled me through my jacket. The Hispaniola still lay where she had anchored, but sure enough there was the Jolly Roger, the black flag of piracy, flying from her peak. Even as I looked there came another red flash and another report that sent the echoes clattering, and one more round shot whistled through the air. It was the last of the cannonade. I lay for some time watching the bustle which succeeded the attack. Men were demolishing something with axes on the beach near the stockade. The poor jolly boat, I afterwards discovered. Anyway, near the mouth of the river a great fire was glowing among the trees, and between that point and the ship one of the gigs kept coming and going, the men, whom I had seen so gloomy, shouting at the oars like children. But there was a sound in their voices which suggested rum. At length I thought I might return towards the stockade. I was pretty far down on the low sandy spit that encloses the anchorage to the east, and is joined at half-water to Skeleton Island. And now, as I rose to my feet, I saw, some distance farther down the spit, and rising from among low bushes, an isolated rock, pretty high, and particularly white in colour. It occurred to me that this might be the white rock of which Ben Gunn had spoken, and that some day or other a boat might be wanted, and I should know where to look for one. Then I skirted among the woods till I had regained the rear, or shoreward side of the stockade, and was soon warmly welcomed by the faithful party. I had soon told my story, and began to look about me. The log-house was made of unsquared trunks of pine, roof, walls, and floor. The latter stood in several places as much as a foot or a foot and a half above the surface of the sand. There was a porch at the door, and under this porch the little spring welled up into an artificial basin of a rather odd kind, no other than a great ship's kettle of iron, with the bottom knocked out and sunk to her bearings, as the captain said, among the sand. Little had been left beside the framework of the house, but in one corner there was a stone slab laid down by way of a hearth, and an old rusty iron bucket to contain the fire. The slopes of the knoll and all the inside of the stockade had been cleared of timber to build the house, and we could see by the stumps what a fine and lofty grove had been destroyed. Most of the soil had been washed away or buried in drift after the removal of the trees. Only where the streamlet ran down from the kettle, 
a thick bed of moss and some ferns and little creeping bushes were still green among the sand. Very close around the stockade, too close for defence, they said, the wood still flourished high and dense. All of fir on the land side, but toward the sea with a large admixture of live oaks. The cold evening breeze, of which I have spoken, whistled through every chink of the rude building, and sprinkled the floor with a continual rain of fine sand. There was sand in our eyes, sand in our teeth, sand in our suppers, sand dancing in the spring at the bottom of the kettle, for all the world like porridge beginning to boil. Our chimney was a square hole in the roof, but it was but a little part of the smoke that found its way out, and the rest eddied about the house, and kept us coughing and piping the eye. Add to this that Gray, the new man, had his face tied up in a bandage, for a cut he had got in breaking away from the mutineers, and that poor old Tom Redruth, still unburied, lay along the wall, stiff and stark, under the Union Jack. If we had been allowed to sit idle, we should all have fallen into the blues, but Captain Smollett was never the man for that. All hands were called up before him, and he divided us into watches. The doctor and Gray and I for one, the squire, Hunter and Joyce upon the other. Tired as we were, two men were sent out for firewood, two more were sent to dig a grave for Redruth, the doctor was named Cook. I was put sentry at the door, and the captain himself went from one to another, keeping up our spirits, and lending a hand wherever it was wanted. From time to time the doctor came to the door for a little air, and to rest his eyes, which were almost smoked out of his head, and whenever he did so he had a word for me. "'That man Smollett,' he said once, "'is a better man than I am. And when I say that, it means a great deal, Jim.' Another time he came and was silent for a while. Then he put his head on one side and looked at me. "'Is this Ben Gunn a man?' he asked. "'I, I do not know, sir,' said I. I am not very sure whether he's sane. If there's any doubt about the matter, he is, returned the doctor. A man who has been three years biting his nails on a desert island, Jim, can't expect to appear as sane as you or me. It doesn't lie in human nature. Was it cheese you said he had a fancy for? Yes, sir, cheese, I answered. Well, Jim, says he, just you see the good that comes of being dainty in your food. You've seen my snuff-box, haven't you? And you never saw me take snuff, the reason being that in my snuff-box I carry a piece of parmesan cheese, a cheese made in Italy, very nutritious. Well, that's for Ben Gunn. Before supper was eaten we buried old Tom in the sand, and stood round him for a while bareheaded in the breeze. A good deal of firewood had been got in, but not enough for the captain's fancy, and he shook his head over it, and told us we must get back to this to-morrow rather livelier. Then, when we had eaten our pork, and each had a good stiff glass of brandy grog, the three chiefs got together in a corner to discuss our prospects. It appears that they were at their wits' end what to do the stores being so low that we must have been starved into surrender long before help came. But our best hope, it was decided, was to kill off the buccaneers until they either hauled down their flag or ran away with the Hispaniola. From nineteen they were already reduced to fifteen. Two others were wounded, and one at least, the man shot beside the gun, severely wounded, if he were not dead. Every time we had a crack at them, we were to take it, saving our own lives with the extremest care. And besides that we had two able allies, rum and the climate. As for the first, though we were about half a mile away, we could hear them roaring and singing late into the night. And as for the second, the doctor staked his wig that camped where they were in the marsh, and unprovided with remedies, half of them would be on their backs before a week. So, he added, if we are not all shot down first, they'll be glad to be packing in the schooner. It's always a ship, 
and they can get to buccaneering again, I suppose. First ship that I ever lost, said Captain Smollett. I was dead tired, as you may fancy, and when I got to sleep, which was not after a great deal of tossing, I slept like a log of wood. The rest had long been up, and had already breakfasted and increased the pile of firewood by about half as much again, when I was awakened by a bustle and the sound of voices. "'Flag of truce!' I heard someone say, and then immediately after, with a cry of surprise, "'Silver himself!' And at that I jumped up, and, rubbing my eyes, ran to a loophole in the wall. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Silver's Embassy Sure enough, there were two men just outside the stockade, one of them waving a white cloth, the other no less a person than Silver himself standing placidly by. It was still quite early, and the coldest morning that I think I was ever abroad in, a chill that pierced into the marrow. The sky was bright and cloudless overhead, and the tops of the trees shone rosily in the sun, where Silver stood with his lieutenant, all was still in shadow, and they waded knee-deep in a low white vapour that had crawled during the night out of the morass. The chill and the vapour, taken together, told a poor tale of the island. It was plainly a damp, feverish, unhealthy spot. "'Keep indoors, men,' said the captain. Ten to one, this is a trick. Then he hailed the buccaneer. Who goes? Stand or we fire. Flag of truce, cried Silver. The captain was in the porch, keeping himself carefully out of the way of a treacherous shot, should any be intended. He turned and spoke to us. Doctor's watch on the lookout. Dr. Livesey, take the north side, if you please, Jim the east, Grey west, the watch below, all hands to load muskets, lively men and careful. And then he turned to the mutineers. And what do you want with your flag of truce? he cried. This time it was the other man who replied. Captain Silver, sir, to come on board and make terms, he shouted. Captain Silver? don't know him. Who's he? cried the captain. And we could hear him adding to himself, Captain, is it? My heart, and here's promotion. Long John answered for himself, Me, sir, these poor lads have chosen me captain off your desertion, sir, laying a particular emphasis upon the word desertion. We're willing to submit if we can come to terms and make no bones about it. All I ask is your word, Captain Smollett, to let me safe and sound out of this ere stockade, and one minute to go get out a shot before a gun is fired. My man, said Captain Smollett, I have not the slightest desire to talk to you. If you wish to talk to me, you can come, that's all. If there's any treachery, it'll be on your side, and the Lord help you. That's enough, Captain, shouted Long John cheerily. A word from you's enough. I know a gentleman, and you may lay to that. We could see the man who carried the flag of truce attempting to hold Silver back, nor was that wonderful, seeing how cavalier had been the captain's answer. But Silver laughed at him aloud, and slapped him on the back, as if the idea of alarm had been absurd. Then he advanced to the stockade, threw over his crutch, got a leg up, and with great vigour and skill succeeded in surmounting the fence, and dropping safely to the other side. I will confess that I was far too much taken up with what was going on to be of the slightest use as sentry. Indeed, I had already deserted my eastern loophole, and crept up behind the captain, who had now seated himself on the threshold, with his elbows on his knees, his head in his hands, and his eyes fixed on the water as it bubbled out of the old iron kettle in the sand. He was whistling to himself, Come lasses and lads. Silver had terrible hard work at getting up the knoll, what with the steepness of the incline, and the thick tree-stumps, and the soft sand, he and his crutch were as helpless as a ship in stays. 
but he stuck to it like a man, in silence, and at last arrived before the captain, whom he saluted in the handsomest style. He was tricked out in his best. An immense blue coat, thick with brass buttons, hung as low as to his knees, and a fine laced hat was set on the back of his head. "'Here you are, my man,' said the captain, raising his head. "'You had better sit down.' "'You ain't a goin' to let me inside, Cap'n?' complained Long John. "'It's a main cold mornin' to be sure, sir, to sit outside upon the sand.' "'Why, Silver,' said the captain, "'if you had pleased to be an honest man, you might have been sitting in your galley. It's your own doing. You're either my ship's cook, and then you were treated handsome, or Captain Silver, a common mutineer and pirate, and then you can go hang.' "'Well, well, Captain,' returned the sea-cook, sitting down as he was bidden on the sand, You'll have to give me a hand up again, that's all. A sweet, pretty place you have of it here. Ah, there's Jim, the top of the morning to you, Jim. Doctor, here's my service. Why, there you all are together like a happy family, in a manner of speaking. If you have anything to say, my man, better say it, said the captain. Right you are, Captain Smollett, replied Silver. Duty's duty, to be sure. Well, now, you look here. That was a good lay of yours last night. I don't deny it was a good lay. Some of you pretty handy with a hand spike hand. And I'll not deny neither, but what some of my people was shook. Maybe all was shook. Maybe I was shook myself, and maybe that's why I'm here for terms. But you mark me, Cap'n. It won't do twice, by thunder. We'll have to do sentry go and ease off a point or so on the rum. Maybe you think we were all a sheet in the wind's eye. But I'll tell you I was sober. I was only dog-tired, and if I'd awoke a second sooner, I'd a caught you in the act I would. He wasn't dead when I got round to him, not he. Well? said Captain Smollett, as cool as could be. All that Silver said was a riddle to him, but you would never have guessed it from his tone. As for me, I began to have an inkling. Ben Gunn's last words came back to my mind. I began to suppose that he had paid the buccaneers a visit while they all lay drunk together round their fire, and I reckoned up with glee that we had only fourteen enemies to deal with. "'Well, here it is,' said Silver. "'We want that treasure, and we'll have it. That's our point. You would just as soon save your lives, I reckon, and that's yours. You have a chart, haven't you?' "'That's as may be,' replied the captain. "'Ah, well, you have it. I know that,' returned Long John. You needn't be so husky with a man. There ain't a particle of service in that, and you may lay to it. What I mean is, we want your chart. Now, I never meant you no harm myself. That won't do with me, my man, interrupted the captain. We know exactly what you meant to do, and we don't care, for now you see you can't do it and the captain looked at him calmly, and proceeded to fill a pipe. "'If Abe Gray,' Silver broke out. "'Avast there!' cried Mr. Smollett. "'Gray told me nothing, and I asked him nothing. And what's more, I would see you and him and this whole island blown clear out of the water into blazes first. So there's my mind for you, my man, on that!' This little whiff of temper seemed to cool Silver down. He had been growing nettled before, but now he pulled himself together. "'Like enough,' said he, "'I would set no limits to what gentlemen might consider shipshape, or might not, as the case were, and, seeing as how you are about to take a pipe, Cap'n, I'll make so free as to do likewise.' 
and he filled a pipe and lighted it, and the two men sat silently smoking for quite a while, now looking each other in the face, now stopping their tobacco, now leaning forward to spit. It was as good as the play to see them. "'Now,' resumed Silver, "'here it is. You give us the chart to get the treasure, boy, and drop shooting poor seamen and stoving of their heads in while asleep. You do that, and we'll offer you a choice. Either you come aboard along of us, once the treasure's shipped, and then I'll give you my affidavy upon my word of honour to clap you somewhere safe ashore. Or, if that ain't to your fancy, some of my hands being rough and having old scores on account of hazing, then you can stay here, you can. We'll divide stores with you man for man and I'll give my affy Davy as before to speak the first ship I sight and send em here to pick you up. Now you alone that's talkin'. Handsomer you couldn't look to get, not you. And I hope, raising his voice, that all hands in this ere blockhouse will overhaul my words, for what is spoke to one is spoke to all. Captain Smollett rose from his seat and knocked out the ashes of his pipe in the palm of his left hand. "'Is that all?' he asked. "'Every last word, by thunder,' answered John. "'Refuse that, and you've seen the last of me but musket-balls.' "'Very good,' said the captain. "'Now you'll hear me. "'If you'll come up one by one, unarmed, I'll engage to clap you all in irons, and to take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, my name is Alexander Smollett, I've flown my sovereign's colours, and I'll see you all to Davy Jones. You can't find the treasure, you can't sail the ship, there's not a man among you fit to sail the ship. You can't fight us. Grey there got away from five of you. Your ship's in irons, Master Silver. You're on a lee shore, and so you'll find. I stand here and tell you so. And they're the last good words you'll get from me, for, in the name of heaven, I'll put a bullet in your back where next I meet you. Tramp, my lad. Bundle out of this place, please, hand over hand, and double quick. Silver's face was a picture. His eyes started in his head with wrath. He shook the fire out of his pipe. Give me a hand up, he cried. Not I, returned the captain. Who'll give me a hand up, he roared. Not a man among us moved. Growling the foulest imprecations, he crawled along the sand till he got hold of the porch, and could hoist himself again upon his crutch. Then he spat into the spring. "'There!' he cried. "'That's what I think of ye. Before the hour is out, I'll stove in your old blockhouse like a rum puncheon. Laugh, boy thunder, laugh! Before an hour is out, ye'll laugh upon the other side. Them that die'll be the lucky ones." and with a dreadful oath he stumbled off, ploughed down the sand, and was helped across the stockade after four or five failures by the man with the flag of truce, and disappeared in an instant afterward among the trees. End of chapter 20